the Voltava. A small river getting wider and slower. We're approaching the city of Prague. Musical accompaniment Friedrich Smetana. Prague, the Voltava Queen, the mother of all cities, Prague, the Golden City. So many people have paid homage to your beauty, the capital of the Czech Republic. The famous vault of a metropolis with its great past. Prague, one of the oldest capitals in Europe. For centuries, Germans and Jews lived close together in the Czech Republic. and writers, an almost unique mysterious place where past and present blend into one. Recent historical events culminated in the Velvet Revolution of autumn 1989, where Czechs demonstrated on Wenceslas Square against the communist regime. They achieved their goal, a new republic with free elections. Bustling street life, a youthful music scene, packed theaters. The city's image is changing. What remains? More than 1,000 years of history. Its imposing history confronts you from all its corners. first became a historical focus point in the 10th century. Between two castles on seven terraces, the city was born. These initial groups of detached settlements grew together, gradually melting into one. On a hill, the Radcani, the main fortress and home to the monarchy. Opposite, upriver, stands the Vizarad. Here's where the history of Prague apparently began. Well, according to legend. On steep cliffs, on the vault of his right bank stands Lebus, the family mother of the Premistrates, the first ruling dynasty in Bohemia. Look, and behold this city. Your splendor reaches to the heavens. Towering above, a high mountain, which due to its high cliffs is called Petrine. If you go there, you'll meet a man in the middle of the woods, building a doorstep for his house. The castle which you will build, you will call Prague. Prague means step and check. This prophecy by the Premonstrate Royal heralded the beginning of a passionate and eventful history which was about to come. Today, the castle of Visirad is a favorite day trip destination for the locals. The oldest construction of Ariel is St. Martin's Rotunda. It dates from the late 11th century. On the side where St. Peter and Paul's church is situated, a Roman basilica from 1080 already stood. Looking at this neo-Gothic building today, it's hard to imagine the wealth of its history. Beside this church, the honored cemetery. Since the 19th century, distinguished Czechs from the arts and sciences have found rest here. The composer Smetana, the writer Jan Neruda, the sculptor,
Joseph Misselbeck, Prague's Art Nouveau painter Alphonse Mucha, to mention only a few. To the north of Vichyrat, stretching along the right bank of the Vltava, the historical center of Prague, the Old Town. In the Middle Ages, these narrow alleys formed the so-called King's Route to the castle. At the most eastern point of the Old Town, the imposing powder gate soars above. From the adjacent former royal courtyard, it's said that the Bohemian rulers, during royal celebrations, paraded through the city. First, they went down Seltner Lane. In those days, mostly bakers lived there. The old expression, Zelt, then meant bread rolls. To reach the Child's Bridge and the other bank, the lesser town, the coronation parade took the old town's ring road. The parade ended in front of the castle gates. Standing tall and ominous on the left bank of the Voltava, the residence of the Bohemian kings and the German emperor. Forty sovereigns governed here. On several occasions, Radcany was attacked and burned to the ground, only to be rebuilt on the same site. Whoever enters the castle on foot today is overwhelmed by its awesome beauty. The main entrance to the castle is at Ratkani Square. The passageway leads through the royal courtyard, past the fighting giants from the Baroque sculptor Ignaz Michael Platzer. The muscle men are indeed only replicas. Across the way, the Matthias Gate, named after the Habsburger Emperor. This construction initiated the birth of the Baroque period in Prague. Empress Maria Theresa commissioned the Austrian architect Picassi from Vienna to transform the castle's second courtyard into a more classical style. The cathedral treasures of St. Vitus are stored in the chapel of the Holy Cross. The St. Vitus Cathedral is the third courtyard's masterpiece, Prague's largest church, the crypt of the Kaiser and the Kings, magnificent reminders of the city's heyday. Originally in the 10th century, a round church was erected here and later a Roman basilica. Matthias von Arras began construction of the Gothic Cathedral between 1344 and 1352. After Arras's death, Charles IV summoned Peter Parler to continue construction. This talented artist from a family of significant builders designed the Vitus Cathedral, which is one of the most important Gothic churches. The Wenceslas Chapel in the cathedral is another example of Peter Pallas's work. Prince Wenceslas, Bohemia's national and patron saint, is buried here. The extremely magnificent lining of the chapel with its gems and gilded molding emphasizes the importance of the room. Peter Parler, who died at age 67, also rests alongside his predecessor, Matthias von Arras, in the cathedral. In the choir area of Johannes von Nepomuk's impressive relic altar, King Wenceslas IV, so the legend says, ordered that the archvicar von Nepomuk be tortured and thrown from the Charles Bridge. Even in the moment of death, the priest still refused to reveal the contents of the Queen's secret confession to her jealous husband. Meanwhile, Back in the third courtyard, on the south side of the square, you'll find the entrance to the former king's palace.
The late Gothic Vladislav Chamber was a sacred place of the Bohemian kings, located in the residential center. Beneath daringly styled curved arches, chamber meetings took place. The monumental hall is considered the most important profanatory of its time in Central Europe. Benedict Reed from Bavaria was the master builder. The court chancery in neighboring Ludwigstracht, a place of immense importance in Bohemian history. Continuous disagreements about religious freedom led to the Praga defenestration on May the 23rd, 1618. The two royal governors and the secretary survived. This event had fatal consequences. Bohemian aristocrats revolted against the Habsburger oppressors. The Thirty Year War began. The way through the castle grounds leads you to St. George's Basilica. Prague's most important Roman church was given, for the early Baroque period, an untypical contemporary facade. Inside the original room, the design was kept undisturbed. The bones of a premislid princess repose in the Lubella Chapel. She was Holy Wenceslas's grandmother and the first Bohemian Christian martyr. On September the 16th, her day of death, many Czechs pilgrimage to her grave. Whereas the tourists prefer to go to George's Alley, to the legendary Little Golden Alley. No other historical place in Prague has so many stories and legends like this narrow alley with its tiny houses. According to folklore, Rudolf II instructed alchemists to search for the stone of wisdom. He believed these stones would lead him to gold. By the end of the 16th century, the Habsburger Kaiser's interest in arts and sciences had attracted an array of artists, scholars, astronomers, alchemists, and charlatans to Prague. More than two centuries after Emperor Charles IV, Prague went through another golden era. Rudolf II, an avid art collector, transformed the Prague Castle into one of the largest museums in the world. For the second and last time, the city became center of the whole empire. Nearby, in the Royal Garden, Kaiser Ferdinand I, Rudolf's grandfather, built a pleasure palace for his wife, Anna. Completed in 1564 by Bonifaz Wormwood, this palace is a unique example of Renaissance architecture north of the Alps. The Ratcanny suburbs are our next destination on the Prague tour. In 1320, the castle's camp declared the settlement in front of the castle's gates a city. After the big fire of 1541, aristocrats and high priests erected their representative palaces. Example, the Schwarzenberg Palace on Ratchkani Square. This magnificent Renaissance construction is built from Italian models and adorned with graffiti. Nowadays, this is used as a museum for military history. Diagonally across is the Archbishop's Palace with its richly decorated Rococo facade. Competing for attention, hidden behind it, the Sternberg Palace with the National Gallery's painting collection. The Ratcanny suburb is not only characterized by its rulers' palaces. Not far from Ratcanny Square, visitors can immerse themselves into a new world in Czech, Novyorskia.
picturesque corners, fairy tale alleys. Who could imagine today that this new world was a ghetto in the 16th century? Nowadays, these narrow, cluttered, delicate houses are covered in art studios. And in the restaurant, the Golden Pear, in Czech, you slap your whiskey, you can eat hearty bohemian food. The softly sounding chimes from Maria Loretto's Pilgrim Church, near Loretto Place. A thousand welcomes, Maria, the 27 bells ring on the hour. In 1694, a proud merchant had the multi-timber glockenspiel in Amsterdam molded. The Loretto Church is one of the Baroque period's pearls. Mr. Dienshofer and his son were the master builders. The sacred house in Casa Santa was erected in the previous century. Legend says it was designed after the Italian Loretto. Apparently, the angels carry the Holy Family's home into this church. Because of its luscious decor, the Christie Church in the East Wing has been compared to a Baroque theatre. The famous Prague Sun, a 12 kilo heavy diamond embedded monstrance of immense value, is kept here in the Lauter Treasure Chamber. Also part of the Radkani suburb, the Monastery Strahov. It stands above the valley which separates the Lorenzi Hill from the Castles Hill. Founded in 1140, today Strahov houses an exceptional tourist attraction, the library's philosophy section. Visitors especially love its ceilings frescoes. In 1794, the great fresco designer, Franz Anton Maulbech from Austria, created these masterpieces. He completed his work in only six months, even though at this time he was already 72 years old. The oldest and most valuable treasure of the collected writings is the Stralov Evangelist, whose text originates from about 800 in Tour. The older of both libraries, the Theological Library, was built between 1671 and 1679 by the Italian Giovanni Domenico Orsay di Orsini. The fantastic panorama from the lower regions of the monastery suggests our next destination, Mala Strana the lesser side. This district at the foot of the castle is a picturesque labyrinth of houses, gardens intertwined with alleys, dreamy locations, and fairy tale corners. There is hardly a more atmospheric trail to descend from Radkani than to take the Malastrana Alley. Baroque houses and old painted signs tell of a life in former times. Even Mozart and Casanova stayed here. It was then known as Spora Gasse. The house of the three small violins was occupied by the violin craftsman family Edlinger. Jan Neruda lived and wrote here, the author of Malastrana stories. The alleyway named after him ends at Malastrana Ring. High above the rooftops, you can see the spectacular dome of the St. Nicholas Church. Here we encounter again Christoph and Killian Ignaz Dienstenhofer, without doubt the dominant Baroque master builders in Prague. The pompous interior of the Nicholas Church 
surpasses all other Prague churches in style. In the 18th century, three generations of artists worked on it. The dome fresco originates from a respected master of Prague Baroque, the native Breslauer Franz Xavier Palko. St. Nicholas's architecture and decor has made it a major symbol of Baroque style. The Jesuit order use it as a sign of their authority. A small break on Malostrana in the Café Malostranska Kavana. This used to be called Café Rudetki. In the early 20th century, this was a popular meeting place for the intellectual elite. Franz Kafka was also a guest here. If you turn into the Tenska from Malostrana, you'll find the gate to the Woodstone Garden. Four houses, a tile workshop and three gardens had to be cleared to build this palace for Albrecht von Wallenstein. Built between 1624 and 1630, this was the first great Baroque castle on this side of the river, constructed by three Italian master builders. The enormous dimensions of this project corresponded with Wallenstein's stance during the Thirty Year War. Out of fear of his growing influence, the Austrian court ordered his murder in 1634. Today the garden is a peaceful oasis. The magnificent garden area, the Sala Terena, the late manneristic loggia, was intended for musical, festival and theatre events. The bronze statues in the park from Andrian de Vries are reproductions. The originals were stolen by the Swedes in the Thirty Year War. They now decorate the garden of the Swedish Dottenheim Castle. To the south of Malostrana, near Carmelite Alley, you'll see the Lobkowitz Palace at the foot of the Lorenzi Hill. The German embassy is situated nearby overlooking the palace's beautiful garden. Even in the 18th century, the palace was one of the main tourist attractions. Back at the Carmelite Alley, here we find Prague's first church with a Baroque-style facade, Santa Maria di Vittoria. She was the holy mother of all victories. After the Battle of Weissenberg, the Lutheran church fell to the hands of the Catholic Carmelite order in 1624. The church hailed Jesuline from Prague as a hero, and he later became a subject of pilgrimage for the monks. His wax figure is adorned by 39 garments alone, one of which was designed personally by the Kaiser's wife, Maria Theresa. The lesser side, an idyllic world, full of fascination, of romantic aura. Here between Maltesh Square and Gross Prioret Square, the visitor feels a sense of timelessness. In quiet corners, you're confronted by dreamy houses, surrounded by noble palaces. Maltesh Square owes its appearance to the lesser known Baroque master builder, Josef Jäger. This Rococo palace is his creation Today, this is home to the Japanese embassy. Take a breather in the traditional inn, the painters. This historical wine bar stands as an example for the political changes since former socialist times. These days, such places are run by French specialists. Among the best customers are certainly the French diplomats who reside around the corner at Bukhoi Palace. The embassy at Graspriat Square also carries all the typical traits of Prague's best Baroque style.
opposite the John Lennon wall. This symbolizes the new lifestyle of young Czechs. The Campo Peninsula nearby, a cozy meeting place for lovers of all nations. The Devil's Brook, or Chetovka, a subsidiary of the Vlatava, separates the Kampa Island from the lesser town. This Montmartre-like district is also known as the Venice of Prague. Nearby, we find the traditional hotel and restaurant Three Ostriches. Ostrich feathers were the latest craze in the year 1597. That's how it got its name. The Child's Bridge connects the lesser town with the old town. It's considered one of the most beautiful bridges in Europe, but has to put up with a never-ending line of tourists. This fascinating open-air gallery, consisting of 30 statues, adorns this Vlatava crossing. two older bridges which were destroyed by floods. In 1357, Kaiser Charles IV commissioned Peter Parler to build a new bridge. Consisting of sandstone, the crossing is 520 meters long and 10 meters wide and supported by 16 pillars. The Charles Bridge has always made history. In 1848, revolutionaries erected the barriers here. It was also the setting for Prague's battle against the Swedes in the last year of the Thirty Year War. In 1393, this was the place where the priest Johannes von Nepomuk was thrown into the Vlatava and drowned. The Old Town's Tower Bridge another masterpiece from Peter Parler. The middle section portrays three of Prague's most historical figures. From left, Charles IV, St. Peter's, and Charles' son, Wenceslas IV. Beautiful bridge headstones on the right bank side signal the gateway to Prague's old town, Stare Musto. This also includes the former Jewish district, Josephov. Our tour begins at the old city's entrance to the Charles Bridge, at the St. Francisca's Church. It belongs to the monastery of the same name, the Men of the Cross with the Red Star, a Bohemian Order of Knights. Christoph Willebald Pluck and Antony Dvorak worked here as organists. Next door, the St. Salvador Church is part of the Clementinum, a giant building complex extending for about two hectares. The construction goes back to the time of Kaiser Ferdinand I. In 1556, he allowed the Jesuits to come to Prague. He also wished to create an alternative to the mainly Protestant-run Charles University. Along with three churches, this former military fortress houses two libraries and an exceptional collection of handwritings. Not all facades in the city's old town can be shown off to the best advantage because the narrow alleys often disturb the view. That's why the Tlamgalas Palace can barely show its entire beauty. The most significant Baroque constructions were financed by Johann Wenceslaus Tlam von Gallus, diplomat on heir to the throne in Naples. 
He commissioned two prestigious artists, the sculptor Matthias Bernhard Braun and the royal architect Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlbach for the palace. The Charles Alley leads straight to the Old Town Ring, the actual historical center of Prague. The most important Bohemian trade routes in the Middle Ages led here to the marketplace, a place which witnessed many historical events. In 1458, George from Pudibrat was elected Hussite king in the town hall. In 1621, 27 Bohemian patriots were publicly executed. They paid for the revolt against the Catholic Habsburgers with their lives. In 1918, the Czechoslovakian Republic was declared here. The mighty monument of Johann Hus looks out over the entire square. Love the truth, defend the truth, and allow everyone the truth. This legacy of the church reformer are chiseled into the base of his monument. From 1402, as principal of Charles University, he fought for the rights of Bohemians in higher education. Already 100 years before Luther, he criticized the church's stance. On the 6th of June, 1415, Hus was burned as a heretic in Constance. The old city town hall on the ring symbolizes the influence of the bourgeoisie. In 1338, King Johann from Luxembourg allowed the Prague people to govern themselves. Since then, the town hall has been continuously altered and renovated. To finance this, they imposed a wine tax. The very thirsty throats of the locals made it possible that 30 years later, a 65 meter high town hall tower was erected. The tower's greatest attraction is its astronomical clock. In 1410, it was first mentioned. Nicholas von Kaden developed its complicated mechanism. On the hour, small figures appear, much to the amazement of the public. While Christ, his betrayer Judas, and the apostles pass by, the bell rings in the new hour. Adjacent to the town hall complex, you'll find Umenuti, a typical construction of Prague Renaissance art. Just like the Schwarzenberg Palace, the facade is extensively decorated with graffiti. Beside the town hall, the towers of the Tyne Church dominate the old town's landscape. The church is situated on the east side of the square, hidden behind the former Tyne School, Tyne meaning customs. In the Middle Ages, the Tyne Courtyard was in fact a secured warehouse with an entrance tax for foreign merchants. A Roman church for the merchants was the predecessor of the Tyne Church. Today's Gothic construction was created between 1365 and 1511. In the 17th century, the Jesuits melted the Hussite symbols they so despised into a glowing ring and placed it around the Madonna as a victory sign of counter-reformation. To the left of the church, the House of the Stony Bell. 
Charles IV's mother and last premise light in Queen Elizabeth is said to be the owner of this early Gothic building. In charming contrast to it is a neighboring Rococo Palace Kinski, a late work of Kilian Ignaz Dietzenhofer's. Franz Kafka attended the German high school here. His father later ran a successful business on the ground floor. This enabled many citizens to enter the once exclusive palace. The most striking building on the northern side of the Old Town Ring is the St. Nicholas Church. Using earlier churches for inspiration, in 1732, a new period of Baroque construction began. And again, at the reigns, the architect, Kilian Ignaz Dietzenhofer's. Directly after this massive construction, he completed the other Nicholas Church in the lesser town. From the Old Town Ring, Paris Street leads you to Josephov, Prague's old Jewish district. The four-story Art Nouveau houses are situated now where once the ghetto stood. Judaism in Prague lived on through literature. Otherwise, only five synagogues, the Jewish town hall and cemetery survived. The cemetery is the oldest in Europe. More than 200,000 Jews have been buried here between the 15th and 18th centuries. Around 11,000 headstones are still intact. The dead lie in 10 layers above one another. symbols are engraved in sandstone and marble. Each person's fate concealed behind each gravestone. Stories of their hope, suffering, ancient craftsmanship and pogrom brutalities. The tomb of Rabbi Luv from 1609. This religious philosopher is known in the history books as the creator of Golem. The legend says that Luv created humans from clay and brought them to life with secret magic to protect the Czech Jews from all enemies. The rabbi's chair can still be seen in the old new synagogue. This is the oldest synagogue in Europe and at the same time, one of the earliest Gothic constructions in the city. For trade purposes, the Jews came to Bohemia in the 10th century. They settled on the right bank of the Blood Tapa. The settlement grew to one of the largest Jewish centers in Europe. In the Second World War, almost 78,000 Bohemian and Moravian Jews were murdered. More than half of them came from Prague. The old new synagogue survived the terror of the Nazi regime. The synagogue managed to escape any destruction. The hands of the town hall clock with the Hebrew numerals turn anti-clockwise. The Baroque-style Jewish town hall houses Prague's last kosher restaurant. The Jewish district, once a community, resembles today a large museum. South of Josephov stands the oldest building of the Charles University. Founded in 1348 by Charles IV, the Carolinum is the oldest college in Central Europe. At that time, about 40,000 people lived in Prague. Several thousand were students. The opening of the Thiel Theater, only meters away from the Carolinum, was met with great disapproval by university professors. 
The professors feared that exposure to the theater's morals might corrupt them. The theater was opened in 1783. Originally, it was called the Nostitz Theater. Four years later, a theater piece made headlines. Mozart's Don Giovanni premiered in Prague. The show was received with great enthusiasm. Mozart conducted it himself. Mozart lived with some friends in the middle of an old industrial area in the old Prague district, Smichov. The Dushek couple had a summer villa in a small green oasis called Betramka. The couple were both musicians. Mozart used the peaceful garden to compose the final sections of his Don Giovanni Overture. In this room, you can see the piano where Mozart completed his work. The famous singer, Josephine Dushek, often invited Mozart to her home. Today, the Petramka House is a Mozart museum. Mozart also lived in the Dushek City apartment near the Coal Market and Field Theatre during his opera rehearsals. We're back in the southern Old Town. The area around the Coal Market is ideal for a city stroll. The business activity in Havetska has a century-long tradition. Textile traders would sell their goods here. In the eastern part of the old town, the late Gothic powder gate catches your eye. It's the starting point of the so-called King's Route. Beside it once stood a royal court. Today it's the site of a gem of Art Nouveau called the House of Representatives and Community. Built between 1906 and 1911, this house is a prime example of secession architecture and decor. On the first floor, in the large Smetana Hall, concerts take place in May as part of the music festival Prague Spring. The pastry shop on the ground floor brings back memories of the earlier coffee houses, talking to friends, relaxing, reading a newspaper, or just watching others. Drinking coffee was always secondary. The pedestrian precinct, shops, international flair, the most popular shopping area is Napikopi. The street follows the course of the former ditch, which separated the old and new parts of the town. They lead directly to Wenceslas Square. It was called Ross Market in the 14th century because horse traders dealt here. In 1348, Charles IV founded the new town, which expanded Prague threefold. This type of daring and spacious planning was unheard of in Europe at that time. Wenceslas Square was destined to become the new town's central point, a pulsating center of all Prague, not only since the demonstrations of 1989. Public gatherings of social and political nature have always played an important role here.
In 1913, a monument was built to commemorate Bohemia's patron, Wenceslas. Now his imposing figure watches over the big square, accompanied by other national patrons, Ludmilla and Agnes, Prokop and Adelbert. The most striking building on Wenceslas Square is the National Museum. This neo-Renaissance structure from 1890 orientates itself on the Paris Louvre. It's the city's oldest museum. Also worth seeing, the priceless gem collection. Wenceslas Square is not only the traffic center of Prague. Nowhere else are there so many restaurants, cinemas, cafes, clubs, bars, and hotels. The Hotel Europe, formerly known as the Archduke Stefan Hotel, offers extremely attractive accommodation. This building is another fine example of Art Nouveau at its best. The interior has been designed to resemble that of the Titanic's. The Hotel Europe's French restaurant has always been a popular backdrop for many films. Whenever you seek shelter from the rain on Wenceslas Square, you'll find an inconspicuous gate at Young Man's Square, a place to reflect on life. The Maria Snow Church. The church was founded in 1347 one day after Charles IV's coronation as Bohemian King. Its choir platform is elevated 39 meters high. The interior dates from the Renaissance. It was originally planned to build the longest and highest church of the city here, even bigger than the St. Vitus Cathedral. Nevertheless, this construction gives the impression of a carefully planned structure Another sacred treasure is the National Theatre. More attractions of the new town include the Temple of Muses and houses from Prague's earliest inhabitants. The Golden Chapel above the Vlatava, christened by the Czechs, is a symbol of national rebirth. The laying of its foundations in 1868 was a moving event. Construction was finally completed in 1883. To celebrate its opening, the opera Le Busa when Smetana was performed. The chapel's rich interior design with mythological wall murals and bronze statues, like this one of composer Janicek in the foyer, stands for the artistic representation of Czech national consciousness. Next door, the modern Novosena building, the new scene, belongs to the National Theatre. Performing now are the international group Laterna Magica. <laughs> Cafe Slavia, across the street, used to be a meeting point for Prague's avant-garde scene. Nowadays, mostly tourists frequent it. If you are the kind of person who likes it dark and cold, then you'll feel at home in the Uflecku beer garden, located in the new part of Prague. The Czech Republic's national drink quenches not only your thirst, but it goes terrific with roast pork, bread dumplings, and kraut. Over a pivo, a beer, the locals in Prague like to discuss and philosophize. That's always been the case. Ufleku has been brewing its own beer since the end of the 15th century. The new town's water tower on Sofia Island also originates from this time. Built in 1495, it looks out over the busy Reslova Street.
which leads from the banks of the Vltava to the new city center. A memorial plaque reminds us of the Czech resistance fighters who carried out assassinations against the Gestapo leader Heydrich on May the 27th, 1942. Barely one month later, the dead bodies of the men were found in the catacombs of St. Cyril's Methodist Church. While the church was erected between 1730 and 1736, presumably under Dienzenhofer's supervision, it was consecrated in the sacred name of Karl Borromeus. Charles Square, where today children play, used to be a Corpus Christi chapel. This is where Charles IV showed the public the crown jewels, the most valuable treasure of the Holy Roman Empire and also the German nation. Not far from here, another example of Charles IV's influence, the Emmaus Monastery, considered to be his most important construction. With this Slavic monastery, he strengthened ties with other areas in southeastern Europe. Serb, Croatian, Russian and Czech monks lived here. On Easter Sunday, 1372, the church's consecration day, a gospel recounting the procession to Emmaus was read out. This is how the church came to its name. The Stations of the Cross Passage is the most important area in the monastery. In 1360, a series of biblical frescoes were added, considered to be the most precious north of the Alps. Directly across from the Emmaus Monastery is a church perched high above the city, thus called St. John's on the Cliff. This impressive Baroque church with its tremendous facade is yet another masterpiece of Kilian Ignaz Dietzenhofer's, one of his early works in Prague. One of our last stops is again architecturally connected with the name Dietzenhofer. In the 19th century, a museum was built for the composer Antony Dvorak at the Villa America. For three years, until his death in 1904, Dvorak was head of Prague's Conservatoire and lived close to Villa America. On the first floor, divine antique painted statues line the walls. Kilian Ignaz Dienzenhofer, immortalized by Prague's buildings, he completed the smaller summer castle in 1720. It was his first work in the city. The palace's style reflects the architectural elegance of the Habsburg's capital Vienna. To stay in Prague without meeting Schweik would be a big mistake. At the bar, the goblet in Newtown, the legend of soldier Schweik lives on, even if only on the walls. Schweik used to meet his friend Wodichka here. Until the war is over, until six in the evening, I'll be in the Kelch bar. Schweik's clever father, Jaroslav Hasek, begins his story in this bar and eats, just like the main character, cold sausages with vinegar and onions. So came about the story of the immortal soldier Schweik, thus one of the most successful satires on the fall of the monarchy and the empire. Now we take our leave of Prague with one of the city's more peculiar constructions. Its red rooftops are visible from far away, the Assumption Church. It was consecrated by Charles the Great. The inspiration for its octagon shape was a German Aachenrhein chapel. 
According to legend, Charles IV commissioned a young ambitious master builder to construct it. He paid for his ambitious dome construction with his life. Out of fear that his construction might collapse, he drowned himself in the Vlatava. This is just another one of those Prague tales, which typifies just how fascinating, and mysterious, inviting and lively this city is. Who could possibly not want to experience the magic of the Golden City?